Church of Scarborough Bibles, we're in the book of Revelation this morning, Revelation chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 to 3 as we begin a long study in this amazing and strange and yet beautiful book, Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Let's go ahead and stand up for the reading of God's Word as we recognize, of course, that God's Word is inspired, inerrant, infallible, the very Word of the true and living God. Listen carefully. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Verse 3, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and who keep what is written in it. For the time is near. May God add this very blessing that we just read to us as we love His Word and His Son. Amen. You may be seated. A great dragon, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and a tail so powerful that he can sweep the stars out of the sky, a beast rising out of the sea, likewise with strange features described, another beast rising out of the earth. We have a a creature that is a lion-like animal with eyes all over its body, and it flies with six wings, and it never stops singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. There's a prostitute that is as beautiful as she is wretched, so wretched in fact that she drinks the blood of her victims. There's demonic frogs, demonic frogs. Did you know there's demonic frogs in this book? Can't wait till we get to the demonic frogs. This book is strange and it's wonderful and it is beautiful. It is all of the above. And it's hard to even believe sometimes that this stuff is actually in the Bible. We might think that this is something that is more apt to come from uh, Tolkien's Middle Earth, for instance, or perhaps this would be the kind of thing that would come out of the creative mind of C.S. Lewis. Maybe some of these creatures are more befitting to the imaginary, fantastical Narnia world than they are fitting to our particular world. Maybe we might look at some of these strange creatures and think that this would be something that that J.K. Rowling would cook up in her Harry Potter series or her Fantastic Beasts book. This seems to be the kind of things that we're more likely to encounter in the Marvel Comics universe of the creative genius of Stan Lee than to see it in the pages of Holy Scripture. And yet, nevertheless, this strange, beautiful, wonderful book is the very text that we are going to be working through together now for the next 72 sermons or so, give or take a little bit of space for Christmas and Easter. We have a lot of work to do before us. Listen to G.K. Chesterton say this about the book of Revelation. Here's a quote. Though St. John the Evangelist saw many strange monsters in his vision, he saw no creature so wild as one of his own commentators. (laughs) I thought that was pretty good. And it's true. The interpretations for this book are all over the map. There have been wild comments, wild interpretations of this book, and many of them, if we're completely honest, are wildly wrong. They've forgotten, haven't they? The simple rule that it is the Bible that interprets the Bible. And so Revelation has been the subject of all kinds of literature. Oh, the press that the book of Revelation has spawned throughout the centuries. We have books about Revelation. We have commentaries about Revelation. We have movies about Revelation. There are TV series about Revelation. There are comic books derived from the book of Revelation. There are prophecy conferences devoted to interpreting this book. Some people have massive charts that they preach in front of all trying to lay out the various details of the book of Revelation. And so many of them are so wildly contradictory to one another that it's hard to know what of these could possibly be true if any of them. One of the main reasons that people go so wildly wrong with the book of Revelation is what I just said, that they forget that it's the Bible that interprets the Bible. And so in their zeal to try to connect particular passages with the book of Revelation to whatever happened in yesterday's news, 
they err. And so we're not, going to tr- we're not going to make that mistake in this series. What we're going to do instead is we're going to allow the book of Revelation to be interpreted by Scripture itself. After all, the book of Revelation quotes the Old Testament more than any other book of the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. In fact, G.K. Beale, one of the commentators that I'm going to be relying on in this series, he says that out of 404 verses that comprise the book of Revelation, 278 of those verses either quotes or refer to or give an image of or some other form of allusion to the Old Testament. Okay, So Revelation is constantly quoting and depending on the Old Testament. And so we're going to use the Old Testament as our interpretive guide to help us to understand this book. And so while all of the prophecy experts tend to preach the book of Revelation with the apocalypse in one hand and yesterday's newspaper in the other, we're going to do something different. We're going to preach the book of Revelation with the apocalypse in one hand and the Old Testament in the other so that we can find out what it is that these strange symbols and creatures and visionary experiences that John saw means. Now, all that by way of introduction, I know that when we come to the book of Revelation, there are various responses to the book. Maybe when I announced that we were going to do 72 weeks in this book, uh, you had an adverse reaction to that announcement. Some of you are very excited about this, as am I. Some of us love the book of Revelation. Others of us dread the book of Revelation. Others of us are just genuinely curious. We just don't know where to start. So you're probably somewhere in that, in that continuum a little bit. On one hand, there are some people that love the book of Revelation so much that they legitimately believe they know what every single detail means. They can tell you what the bear's feet means. They can tell you what the sixth horn on the second beast is but they can't define the doctrine of justification. That's a problem, right? That's a problem. Some people are so interested in the book of Revelation that they've missed the whole scope, the broader panoply of God's revelatory truth and things like the doctrine of justification. Look, I'll tell you this right now. If you can't distinguish between justification and sanctification, it doesn't matter what the bear's feet mean. You're missing the whole point of the New Testament. We don't want to make that mistake. On the other hand, there's people who dread this book, and they're legitimately sort of terrified by the imagery here. I already told you about a prostitute that drinks the blood of her victims. Are you interested in that? I don't know. Now, there's some strange things in this book, and we're going to have to deal with that. But I think probably most of us, and this is the camp that I've been in for most of my life, as I'm genuinely curious about the book of Revelation, I just don't know where to start. And so I've been a pastor now for 20-some years, doing full-time ministry since I was 22 years old. I've never preached through the book of Revelation. I've been scared. I'm scared to do it. I've been told even this morning that this church has not done a long series in the book of Revelation either. So this is going to be new for a lot of us here, and we're going to do our, our very, very best to work through it. I'll tell you this, by the way, as well. The early church wasn't sure what to make of the book of Revelation, and that's pretty well established fact because the book of Revelation, although it is inspired and inerrant and infallible like every other of the 65 books of the Bible together comprising 66, Revelation was one of the slower books to be received into the canon of the early church. There were a lot of churches that didn't know what to make of this book because it didn't sound like scripture to them. And so this actually frustrates some of the biblical scholars that work with the the New Testament manuscripts, you know, the kinds of textual scholars that deal with the the manuscripts and the papyrus and the vellum and the codices and all of the very early copies of Scripture. And it frustrates them because there aren't a lot of ancient copies of the book of Revelation. And the reason is, again, because it was slow to be received by the early church. And what that tells us is that they too had those kinds of various reactions to the book. Some were overly curious and got into the details and made some mistakes. Others of them were just like, I'm not sure what to do with this. And others of them were genuinely curious but didn't know where to begin. And so the early church was kind of in the same boat that you and I are when we come to this particular book. And so today, all I'm going to try to do today is we are literally just going to dip our big toe into the water. That's as far as we're going to get today. We've got many other weeks to do this together. So I'm going to now this morning begin our study by asking three questions of the book of Revelation and trying to answer them to the best that we're able to do by way of introduction to this series. Here are the questions that we're going to answer. Number one, 
what is this book? What is it? What, what is the essence of this book? What, what does this consist of? This is different from the other stuff in the Bible, obviously. It seems different, at least. So first, we're going to ask a question about the nature of the book. What kind of literature and material are we working with here? Second of all, we're going to ask the simple question, very simple, and I'll give a simple answer to it. Where did we get it? How did we get it? Okay, so how did this book um, get handed down to us? Third, why should we read it? And interestingly enough, all three of these questions are answered in the very first paragraph of the book, which we've just read, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. So I hope you have your Bible open with you. I'm going to have my Bible open with me up here on the pulpit. So let's just, just begin by asking the first question, what is this book? Let's start off in chapter 1, verse 1. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. Okay, so the essence of the book is right here in the first line. This book consists of a revelation. Let's talk about that word. All right. So the word revelation, re-veil. To re-veil. Now, what is a veil? A veil is a cover. Now, to re-veil, something means to pull back the cover, so that what is behind it may be fully seen. We have a very beautiful demonstration of reveiling whenever we watch a marriage, especially a traditional marriage. If you've seen a marriage before, when the bride walks down the aisle, usually the groom is already standing up front. She's accompanied by her, uh, by her father, who brings her to her newfound husband. And what the bride does is a revelation in that moment, because she takes the veil that is over her face and she pulls it back so that for the first time, at least that day, the groom can look upon the face of his beautiful bride now reveiled or unveiled. So to reveal something is to simply disclose what is behind it, right? And in fact, that's exactly what the word that John uses here in Revelation 1.1 in the Greek means. It has exactly the same meaning. Revelation is an English word that comes from the Latin, but the Greek word here is apocalypse or apocalypto, or apocalypsis, but it means exactly the same thing. Apo means from, and calypsis means to cover. So an apocalypsis is what is removed when the cover is removed, and you can see what is behind it. I want you to picture this as kind of an illustration. You've all been to a stage play before, maybe a middle school play or the high school play or something like that. At the beginning of every play, you have the apocalyptic moment where the, the, the curtains are rolled back and it is now apparent who the players are on the stage, right? You've seen this before? This is exactly what John is talking about here. The curtains are going to be pulled back and we're going to see reality for what it is. We're going to see the main players on the stage. We're going to see what we couldn't see previously because now these things are going to be apocalyptoed for us. They're going to be ray veiled for our sake so that we can see the beauty of the bride, if you will. Now, it turns out that the word apocalypto or apocalypsis in the New Testament actually has a couple of different shades of meaning. Let me take you into those shades of meaning a little bit further. Everybody with me so far? First of all, sometimes the word apocalypse can mean when you understand a deep mystery or a concept. If you've ever had an aha moment, you've had an apocalypse, right? Uh, to get something and you're like, oh, okay, I get it. You had an aha moment. That's an apocalypto moment. That's when you get something that has been previously hard to understand. Let me give an example of this. 1 Corinthians 14.6, Paul says, How will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or vision? When Paul says, I'm going to bring you, Corinthians, a revelation, he's not necessarily saying, I'm going to show you a bunch of dragons. What he's saying here is, I want you to understand I want you to have an aha moment related to the basic concepts of doctrine. So sometimes that word doesn't take on any kind of mystical connotation at all. It simply means that you understand something more profoundly than you had before. Okay? Though sometimes the word apocalypse in the New Testament does seem to take on some sort of a spiritualized visionary connotation, such as in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, where Paul says this, Remember the context here. Paul says, To keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, 
a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. Now here, Paul is obviously talking about some sort of visionary experience. In fact, he even goes on to say, I'm not even sure if it happened in the body or spiritually or just in my mind. Like Paul is confused by it. And yet he's been taken to the third heavens there in that section. And he has now seen and experienced things that he didn't understand before. Okay. Sometimes the Bible even uses the word apocalypse in a more technical sense when it's referring to the return of Christ. Okay? So here's an example. 1 Peter 4.13 says, this is Peter writing, But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, so that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed, when his glory is apocalyptoed. When is that going to happen? Well, when he returns, of course. And so Peter is saying here, look, I want you to think about your sufferings in light of the fact that one day the curtains are going to be split and Christ is going to come back and you're going to see him for all of his beauty and your glory. So think about that next time you're suffering. Okay. So this word apocalypto does have some shades of meaning. And what I want to tell you this morning is that in the book of Revelation, we're going to see all three of those shades of meaning coming out. On one hand, we're going to learn some basic doctrines about the faith. We're going to have some aha moments where we better understand what it is that Christ has done for us. On the other hand, we're going to see some real dreams and vision that are going to require some interpretive uh, attempt on our part to get into the meaning of these symbols. And not only that, but we are most certainly looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ. There's no question about it that this book does look forward to and heightens our anticipation for the return of Jesus. If it doesn't do that in you, something's wrong. Okay, And so as it turns out, apocalyptic literature actually becomes something of a genre of literature, just as an epistle is a style of literature and a narrative is a genre of literature and poetry and song and, and liturgy. These are all styles of literature. Each one of them has their own special nuances and wrinkles apocalyptic literature is its own thing, and we're not really used to it. By the way, if you're interested, we do have four books of the Bible that utilize apocalyptic literature techniques. Do you know what they are? Well, we know one of them, Revelation. Name another. Daniel, yes. Give me another. Ezekiel, and then I'll spot you Zechariah. uh, Yeah, uh, Zechariah, exactly, the fourth one. These four books all have some intonations of apocalyptic literature, which is usually hallmarked by such thing as fanciful creatures, either real or imagined, numerology, we're going to get into that, angels and demons, which certainly do exist in reality, yes, and then a lot of vivid images like blood, smoke, fire, plagues, and even astrological objects in the sky. Those are all kind of the hallmark the stylings of what apocalyptic literature looks like. Now notice this though, let's go back to the text in verse 1. What is this an apocalypse of? It is a revelation of Jesus Christ. So what is being revealed here? Who is being revealed here? It's Christ. And not to get too grammatical with you so early on a Sunday morning, but the word of (laughs) has two meanings. Sometimes it means from, right? And sometimes it means about. So this revelation Of Jesus Christ, does that mean it's from him or does that mean it's about him? I would say actually both. Okay? This is from him and about him. And the point of this revelation is that we would learn to love our Savior more than we do today. If you get through this entire 72 sermon series and you know the meaning of every horn on every beast and you don't love Jesus more, we've failed. Who is this book for? For his servants. To show his servants what must soon take place. That doesn't just mean the servants in the first century. That doesn't mean medieval theologians meditating on these great spiritual concepts. It doesn't mean that evangelist on the street corner with a sign that says the world is about to end. It doesn't mean the professor lecturing in the lecture hall with his brown jacket and the cool elbow patches. I want one of those jackets, by the way. Those are cool. This book is for you. This book is for the servants of Jesus Christ. Now, let's go on then to the second question. And we'll continue to answer the first one as we go along, but that's enough for this morning. How did we get this book? 
Well, look at verse 1-1-B and into verse 2. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Now, there's kind of a chain of custody here, if you, if you read carefully. This apocalypse, this revelation, comes from God through Christ to the angel to John, and then finally to you and to me. You see the chain of custody there? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, so God gave it to Christ, to show to his servants by way of the angel who gives it to John, who gives it to us. Question. Who's John? Well, you know John. You know John. We've known John for a very long time. Do you know which John this is? This is John, the writer of the Gospel of John. Let's not make this harder than it seems. Okay? This is John who wrote John. This is John who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. It's the same John. It's the same John who, in John chapter 13, leaned upon the shoulder of our Lord and whispered at the Lord's Supper, Who is it that will betray you? It's that John. You know him. It's the same John who had the privilege, along with his brother James and along with Peter in Matthew chapter 17, to see that transfigured, glorious Jesus Christ. Remember the scene of the transfiguration? That's that John. Which John is it? It's the same John that Jesus called to himself by the sea in Mark chapter 1 and simply said, follow me. And he had. And he does. That's the John that we're talking about here. Now, there's another theory out there that this is a different John. Uh, I don't buy that theory. There's another theory that there's a John of Ephesus who is an, another early church leader that's distinct from the Apostle John. Uh, the reason that some conjecture that is because of the apparent familiarity with the churches in and related to, uh, to Ephesus and Asia Minor here in chapters 2 and 3. I don't think it's a different John. I'm going to give you two reasons I don't. Number one, because the style of the writing is the same. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth, and I'm not bragging here. Please don't think this is a humble, a humble brag on my part. But I read Greek every morning. I get up at 5.30. I read my Bible in the New Testament in Greek, and in the Old Testament, I read the Greek Septuagint version of the Old Testament. I just do. I'm not good at it, but I do it every day. Studied Greek in seminary, studied Greek in college. I'm more of a plotter than an expert. I definitely don't consider myself an expert in Greek, though I try really, really hard to read Greek every single day. Uh, I'm more like a guy with a machete kind of hacking my way through the jungle at times. I have to look up words. I have to use helps to get me through it, but I keep going because I love it. And I'm not an expert, but I'm good enough to tell you this. It's the same style as the Gospel of John. It really is. That's obvious to me, and I'm not an expert. I'm a plotter, but even I can see that. Now, sometimes scholars will make arguments based on style, and I usually find those arguments to be very unconvincing. For instance, at the ending of the Gospel of Mark, there's a longer ending that some scholars say is a different style than the rest of the Gospel of Mark. I personally find that argument unconvincing. I don't buy it. There's other scholars that will tell you that maybe Paul didn't write Ephesians because that book has a little bit different style than the rest of Paul's writings. Again, I'll tell you, I don't buy it. Okay. I hold to the traditional authors of the Bible that the, the church has historically held to throughout the ages, and that author is John. Okay. And I will tell you, you don't have to believe me if you don't want to, but I know enough Greek to know that the style of Revelation is the same as the style of the Gospel of John. Here's my second reason I believe it's the same John, because church history tells us that. So these, look, the, the apostles are real people. It's history. This isn't, this isn't imaginary. John lived. And John, our John, mentored a guy called Polycarp. Polycarp mentored a guy named Irenaeus. And Irenaeus tells us that John wrote Revelation. So that's only like two friendships away. Okay, So if, if Glenn mentored me and I mentored Jake and Glenn told me something and I told it to Jake, that's a pretty short chain of Communication there, right? So Irenaeus says, John wrote Revelation, I believe it. Justin Martyr tells us the same thing. 
that John wrote Revelation. So I don't really think we have much of a controversy here. I'm going to proceed as follows, that John is the author of the book of Revelation. I hope you join me in that conviction. Now, the next thing I'm going to say is going to be the hardest thing we're going to do this morning. So if you're sleeping, wake up. Uh, stomp on your neighbor's foot if he's kind of dozing a little bit right now. Just kind of step on their toe. Pull out a fresh stick of gum if you need to wake yourself up a little bit. Pinch yourself. I want to talk very briefly about the schools of interpretation of this book. And so I need you to hang with me because this is going to be kind of major framework here. There are different schools of interpretation for how to proceed in the book of Revelation. I want to tell you where I'm starting from and I hope you will join me with this, okay? One one says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Question, how soon? Well, that's one of the biggest things we have to figure out. So here's the four schools of interpretation. Mine will be the fourth school I'm going to give you. First of all, this there's a school of interpretation called the preterist interpretation. Preterist. When I studied Spanish, the preterito was the past tense, and that's what that is here. The preterists are those who look at the book of Revelation, and they say that this book, surprisingly, primarily refers to things that have already taken place in the past. It's already over. Okay. The preterists look at the book of Revelation and they say, this, is, this already happened. And that surprises a lot of people. And we say, well, when did that happen? And they will tell you that the majority of the events in the book of Revelation took place in 70 AD when the Romans came in and conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. Okay, That happened. That's a fact. The Romans came in under Emperor Titus, destroyed, conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. And the preterist interpretations look at the book of Revelation and say all of these judgments that are described here in this book were primarily fulfilled in the 70 AD conquering of the city of Jerusalem and destruction of the temple. And I will grant to you, yes, I will grant to you that that event is definitely significant in the history of redemption because that ends temple sacrifice. That's a big shift, right? But we don't need temple sacrifice anymore because we have Christ. He is the sacrifice. And so the preterist school of interpretation looks at the book of Revelation and pretty much after page after page, they look at this and they say, 70 AD, 70 AD, 70 AD, this is done, that is done, that is done. And then they get to the end of the book and, they, and then they say, Jesus is going to come back. Now, I'm not a preterist, okay? There are some strengths of that school but that's not my school. Second of all, let's go to the opposite. There is a school of interpretation called the futurist school. The futurists, they look at the book of Revelation. You probably know where I'm going with this, right? They say it's all in the future. And this is where you get your left behind series of books. This is where you get your left behind movies. This is where you get a lot of the prophecy conferences that people go to. This is where the popular books that really, really sell in the Christian bookstores that you probably shouldn't buy. That's what these, that's what these people say. It's all in the future. And primarily, they want to pin the events of this book to the return of Christ in the tribulation, which in that view is seven years centered around the return of Jesus Christ. And they have different, different interpretations there. But they're going to look at most of the book and say, almost none of this has happened yet. We're waiting for all of it. Okay. I, there's some strengths there. There's also some weaknesses in my view. Third camp is the historicist camp. The historicist camp says this, that the book of Revelation is primarily predictive prophecy that is fulfilled century after century in the history of the church, okay? So the historicist view looks at the book of Revelation, and they're trying to find things in church history. So for instance, they want to find the patristic era, and they're going to try to find the medieval era, and they're going to try to find like the dark ages and look at the plagues. They're going to look and try to find where the rise of the papacy is in the Revelation. They're going to try to find Martin Luther and the Reformation era in the book of Revelation. They're going to try to find things like the discovery of the new world in the book of Revelation. And then almost all historicists end up at the end of the book with their own age and generation. And therein is the problem because every time somebody makes a historicist sketch, they usually end up with their own life as the end. 
And a lot of them need to do some serious recalibration because a lot of the historicists have been dead for 300 or 400 years. You see the mistake? So I am in the school of interpretation that is called the idealist or the redemptive historical idealist camp. And what we do with the book of Revelation is we take every single chapter, every single vision for what it is, and we're trying to find the great themes of Scripture contained in these visions. Okay, I'll give you an illustration in just a moment. We're looking at these vivid pictures that depict for us spiritual realities that are relevant in every day and age of the church. Okay? So whether you were alive when Nero was alive in the first century, or whether you were alive in Martin Luther's time, or whether you are a Christian today, all of these visions are going to be relevant to you and to me. Okay? And what we're looking for when we study the book of Revelation is the meta-themes of Scripture. Worship, sin, Christ, faith, perseverance, persecution, good versus evil. Yes, plenty about judgment in the return of Christ. No question about that. Okay? But the thing about the idealist camp, and this is one of the advantages, is we don't necessarily need to try to make every passage fit in some sort of a sequential, chronological unfolding of events. Okay? They don't have to fit on a chart, necessarily. And I'll give you a great example of what I mean by this. If you flip with me very briefly to the end of chapter 11, we've got the seventh trumpet. And as you know, the seventh is the complete and the final. The seventh trumpet is essentially the judgment of the world. It's the last trumpet. And yet in chapter 12, the birth of Christ How does the birth of Christ follow after the final judgment? Well, because each one of these visions needs to be taken on its own. Each one of these visions needs to be looked at in its own rights. And we don't need to try to smush these things into some very strict schema or chronology of sequential events. Now, somebody will object, but wait a second. Doesn't John say, and then I saw, and then I saw, and then I saw throughout the book? Yes, he does. But that doesn't mean that the events and the visions and the beasts and the judgments are all going to necessarily fall in some sort of sequential chronological order. John is simply telling you the order that he saw those events. Okay? So we don't need to have a chart that is going to completely and perfectly sketch out all of the events of world history. In other words, idealism frees me from the stress of having to find Mikhail Gorbachev somewhere in the book of Revelation. Okay. I don't need to find the Russian incursion of Crimea somewhere in this book. I don't need to do that if I'm an idealist. Because what I'm looking for is the meta-themes that God is revealing to us in Christ, about Christ, in this book. Does that make sense? So let me give you an illustration for what idealism is like. Idealism is something like going to an art gallery. All right? You go into an art gallery, what do you have? you got vivid images everywhere. Vivid images. And what you want to do in an art gallery is you want to stand in front of each one and take it in. You want to be impressed by every, by every vision, by every scene, by every depiction there. And you want to let that particular piece speak to you of its trueness and its fullness. And not only that, but in a good art gallery, a lot of times the artwork is going to be based around a theme. Okay, so you've got, here's Picasso's blue period, but the pieces may be somewhat separate from one another. Or maybe you've got, here's the high Renaissance era, uh, or here's a gallery of Caravaggio, or whatever. But as you're moving through the art gallery, if you're trying to interpret the whole thing and try to make every single piece fit with every other piece, you're probably going to run into problems, because they're not meant to do that. So in idealism, we're going to take every event, every vision, every beast, and we're going to try to discern what it means using Old Testament a key symbolism to help us to understand the symbols. And therefore, we want to be moved and impressed to love Christ greater as we see these mega gospel themes unfolded for us in the book. 
Okay? I hope that makes a little bit of sense. All right? Let's go on to the third question here, and then we need to wrap up and, and close up for this morning. So the third question then is, why should we read this book? 72 sermons, that's a lot. Is this worth it? Well, I think it is worth it. And the reason that I think it is worth it is because John, the apocalyptic writer, has told us what the benefit is right here in verse 3. Look down at verse 3. There's a blessing attached here. Yes, look at this. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. I love that because I get to read it every week. So I get a blessing for this. And I want that blessing. And look, there's something for you too here. Look, look at the next one. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it for the time is near. So there are blessings attended to those who hearken unto the message of this book. And we want that blessing. We're going to get it. We're going after it. Now, I could, in, in Johannine style, I could give you about six reasons why we shouldn't do this. Here, let me give them to you. It's hard. We shouldn't do it because it's hard. We shouldn't do it because it's controversial. We shouldn't do it because Christians have stumbled all over themselves trying in the past. We shouldn't do it because we're not trying to be prophecy experts anyway. Maybe we shouldn't do it because we're not trying to be clever and see something clever that the ages of other believers hadn't seen before. And not only that, but we're definitely not going to try to play pin the tail on the dragon during this series either. So there's a bunch of reasons why we shouldn't do this book. Maybe we should move on to something else. But but I think we ought to take very seriously the blessing that is given here. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and those who keep what is written in it for the time is here. Did you you get that? That it's actually made to be corporate? The intention of John, he tells us this right in the very beginning, is that this is something that one would do together with the church. Because if there's going to be one who reads it aloud and many who then hear the word, then the intention is that this book is for the corporate gathered church to study together, which is exactly what we're going to do. And here's a little, here's a little tidbit for you. What's John's favorite number? Come on, you know, what is it? Seven. Everything's sevens in this book. There's some other numbers. He uses tens. Um, he likes twelves. He likes 144,000, right, at least once. But seven's his favorite number. It's the number of completion. It's the number of perfection. And this is kind of interesting. I learned this preparing for this morning. When you read through the book of Revelation, he doesn't say it, but you probably won't be surprised to find out that seven times throughout the book, he lays a blessing for those who will study it. And here they are. Let me give them to you. Uh, 1 3, the one we just read. In chapter 14, verse 13, he says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. In 1615, he says, Stay awake and keep your garments on, and you'll be blessed. Always good advice. In 199, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper. In 26, chapter 20, verse 6, blessed are those who participate in the first resurrection. In 22, 7, blessed are those who keep the words of this prophecy. And in 22, 14, blessed are those who wash their robes and have access to the tree of life. Seven times in the book of Revelation, not surprisingly, you will find the very blessing of the Lord as you pursue him, love him, and stay faithful to him no matter what happens. And if we do that, we will be a church that is faithful and strong and persevering through trial. Amen. Let's go.